Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Three o'clock, isn't it? Saturday, April the 25th, on what should have been our final day of the season, our Sky Bet League Two fixture against Port Vale at Home Park. But as we know, that's not taking place. We should have been really celebrating promotion today, shouldn't we? Unfortunately, uh, the question of what will happen for the rest of the season remains very much unanswered. And, and that's what brings us together this afternoon to keep us all associated with the club that really is connecting with us as much as possible during this lockdown. And questions have been selected this afternoon pertaining to the current crisis in football, let alone at Plymouth Argyle. And some of the regular topics at these events, I know, are, are there going to be peas in the pasties next season? How much will the pasties be? We've got a lot of important things to do that are really relevant to this time. So that's what we're going to concentrate on this afternoon. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined, as you can see on your screens, by club chairman Simon Hallett, the chief executive Andrew Parkinson, and director of football Neil Jusnip. And if you have questions for the panel, a lot have been sent in. And thank you for all the questions that you have sent in. But feel free to comment on the YouTube channel. We're on there on the Plymouth Argyle YouTube channel, as well as the Plymouth Argyle website. But on the YouTube channel, there is the opportunity for you to comment. And if we can fit some comments in between now and three, we will. So uh, let's introduce you formally to everybody this afternoon. Um, from Pennsylvania, good morning, Chairman, owner Simon Hallett. Morning, Gordon. Good morning, everybody. And I hope that you and Jane are keeping well. Uh, we're keeping uh, very well. It's embarrassingly well, to be honest. Um, the weather's nice. Jane's gone out for a walk. Uh, we've got well stocked fridges. We've got um, plenty of room to wander around. So I'm afraid that we're we're about as good as it could be in these terrible circumstances. Yes. Good. Um, fans did receive some rather sad news this week. Yes, I think uh, we should just recognise the passing of uh, Tony Hooper, who you're obviously a very long time fan, um, a member of the board of the Argyle Fans Trust. And I think it's fair to say a highly constructive critic of the club whilst being a very loyal supporter. So the thoughts of the entire Argyle family are with his family uh, at, at this difficult time. Indeed. Simon, thank you for those words. Andrew Parkinson, our CEO, is with us as well. This must have been, Simon, uh, an incredibly busy few weeks for you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Gordon. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, it has been. Um, of course, I'm working from home, but um, it is working at home. Uh, it's great to be with the family, but uh, this is an awful lot to do at the moment, too. But um, uh, we're getting on very well. Um, we've got a great team in place to be able to, to, to do that. And, and I'm sure everyone will agree that in the current circumstances, uh, the club's held up pretty well. And Director of Football, Neil Jusnip, with us as well. And Neil, an extraordinary time for you, one that you never envisaged in, in with your great experience in football. Uh, firsts, uh, usually firsts are, uh, you know, quite enjoyable, uh, but this definitely isn't. But uh, we're trying to work very hard uh, under the current circumstances for the club. Indeed. Well, let's crack on with the first question. It comes from Leon Horn and it's directed to you, I think, really, Simon, this first one. It's about the club's finances. Are they secure? And if not, will Plymouth Argyle have to rely on financial support from shareholders to secure its short term future during this pandemic? Um, well, both, both, both are true. The uh, club will have to rely on shareholder support in the short term. Uh, we will run out of cash um, at some time in the next uh, few months. And at that point, I've said that I will support support uh, the club's gap in its finances. You know, the, the, the trouble with football is that we get our money in advance and we commit to spending it um, based upon the revenues that we expect to get from match days, as well as the money that comes in advance from media, from the Premier League and so on. So now that we have no revenues from match days, um, there's going to be a gap in our. I, I will uh, plug that gap at least at least in the short term. We've uh, promised to make everybody whole uh, through the end of uh, end of June, so you know another two and a half months or so. 
Um, I, I, that I, news in your statement was very well received, but of course, none of us know how long this will continue. No, exactly. And I think we made that very clear in the statement. We don't know how long it will continue. And, you know, my commitment to plug the hole obviously can't be open ended. Um, the, the issue here is not so much the survival of Argyle, but the survival of uh, the Football League and, you know, all its participants. Um, if the Football League can't survive, then obviously, you know, th there's an issue for Argyle. But um, I think that relative to most clubs in the Football League, Argyle's in a very, very strong uh, financial position. Um, you know, I've, I'm in a position to continue to be able to support the short term uh, gaps in funding. We own our own stadium. We're uh, almost entirely debt free. We still own, owe a little bit to Plymouth City Council, but um, we're, we're, we're financially strong um, and relative to the other clubs, uh, we are extremely well off. But there is a kind of systematic, systemic problem with football that uh, needs to be resolved. And if that can't be resolved, then, then Argyle has a problem as well. The next question has been put by two of our supporters, Gary Palmer and also David Marks. And I think, Andrew, your best position to answer, if Argyle have to play in front of empty stadiums, as seems a real possibility at the moment, how would the club generate any income? Are there plans to increase match day cash flow? Should this be the case? And, and if so, how would you do that? Mm. Look, it's uh, going to be. A, it is a massive challenge, and it's obviously one that we're we're looking at. Um, we, you know, everyone will know that um, uh, the clubs in Leagues One and League Two, the, the, they um, get their their income uh, primarily from match day and from non um, non TV broadcasting revenues. So it's very different to the Premier League. We're very dependent on our match day income. So if you look at all those different streams, whether they be ticket revenue, whether they be um, concessions, whether they be the retail store opening, all of those things, the hospitality that we have on a match day, um, for the foreseeable, that looks very uh, difficult to see how we might be able to, 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 to deal with that. So in order to address that, we've got to look at a number of different things. Uh, one is we, we're actively in discussions with the EFL. Um, so, you know, um, it's, it's as Simon has said, it, it is a, it's a football problem as much as an Argyle uh, problem. So we need to look at things collectively in many ways. So one opportunity that there may be is if we do play behind closed doors is being able to broadcast those games live as, a, as an example. Um, that's a, certainly a discussion that's on, on the table. And um, if we can do that, there's potential then, of course, to potentially generate revenue from doing that. I think the other areas that we may have, and again, this is, um, you know, other sources of revenue we've got to look at. At some point, one would imagine, of course, that uh, with social distancing and with safety in mind, we may be able to, um, uh, if you like, free up some of the things that we're, we're, um, we're which generate revenue. As an example, uh, we're looking at the online store um, being open from May uh, from May the 11th, and then, of course, further down down the line, there may be social distancing measures which allow a store to be open. So, but of course, these are small things to to really get into the, the whole nub of it. And um, obviously, we're still presented with the costs, and that's a challenge. Are there plans at the moment whereby, as a board? you're being very inventive in the sort of things that you could introduce. I'm thinking of the crowdfunder and one or two of the ideas that have come from there. So are you looking at more marketing opportunities perhaps? Yes, I mean, I, I think uh, the one thing that, uh, one thing that uh, this situation has done is m m looked at how we can be creative in, in uh, generating funds and in reducing costs, of course, too. But, uh, the crowdfunder was a fantastic initiative and that actually came from fans uh, originally so um, it's a good example of where people if they've got great ideas and they they uh, forward this, them to us and we can take a look at them and we're nearly at the fifty thousand pound mark which is which is unbelievable from just a few weeks ago um, and of course it has the double in incentive of supporting the nhs for every hundred pounds that we we uh, managed to, to, to gain then, uh, uh, it means a ticket for an, somebody within the NHS. So it's, it's fantastic we've been able to do that. But yes, as a board, as a group, as a 
management team. We look at we're looking at all sorts of ways that we'll be able to do that. I think it's fair to say we've also been supported in this by the EFL and by some of the other authorities. So there have been issues about accelerating uh, revenues. Um, we've had advance payments from the Premier League, for example. And on delaying the payments that we owe, the uh, tax authorities, HMRC, have allowed us to delay making PAYE payments. So there's been a lot of help with the short term cash flow. But the real issue is being more inventive about, you know, getting revenues in now that we're not going to have to pay back in future. And, you know, even the crowd funder, the, there will be costs involved with delivering the goods and services that people have uh, very, very kindly paid for now. So it's being more imaginative about longer term sources of funding that, you know, we're turning our attention to now. I think it's um, an important point that Simon makes too, because um, of course, yes, we've got to look at what we can do to generate revenue, but we 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 need a league, and we need to be able to be able to play other teams as well, because football obviously is a game with competition and other teams to be able to play. So we have to approach some of these problems as a collective too. And um, Rob Chapman asked Andrew, what what about the current shirt sponsorship and and indeed the kit sponsorship? When are those contracts due to expire? Well, we, would, we wouldn't talk um, individually about specific, um, wouldn't be appropriate to specific contracts. But what I can say but by, about both of those, um, uh, you know, but both of those, both Puma and indeed Ginsters, they've been tremendously supportive of us. And uh, we, we've got, we will be doing kit launch um, in the not too distant future. Um, and we'll be working with Puma, Puma on that and are working with Puma on that. And also Ginsters um, as well have been fantastically supportive. So we see them as um, being very much part of our answers and solutions for the future. But of course, you know, it goes without saying every business has got its own problems to wrestle with here. So we again comes back to that collective um, working together. But they've been really great, um, great for us. And um, we, we've had some tremendous support from them in the short term. Okay, Neil, uh, don't don't worry. You're not going to get away with it. You're going to get a good grilling in a minute from, from some fans. But uh, first, Andrew, um, Daniel Knight says he's curious about the financial impacts of COVID-19 and specifically how much it will cost the club to play remaining games behind closed doors. And if possible, he'd like to know what's the probability of the season being finished. Right. Well, I'll, I'll take the first one first, because I think there's probably, um, you know, we've all got views on that as well. Uh, I think, um, first of all, on on the on the costs, I think um, if and when we do come back to be playing uh, behind closed doors um, and if that is and that's the um, that's a sort of indication from the EFL that that might be um, the way things uh, might be approached. Uh, then, of course, it, it doesn't come without cost because we would still need significant numbers of people in order to be able to operate the stadium. Um, we may not need turnstile, opera turnstile operators or we may not need stewards, but we will still need, I think, you know, uh, there'll be lots of measures, I, I presume, put in place for safety and for hygiene and for making sure that everybody's checked. And um, I think there'll be a whole raft of different regulations that will be in place to, to do that. And then of course, um, if football is played behind closed doors, um, you've also got um, you know the media and um, the, the media side of things and the broadcasting that will be a big element, I think, of, uh, of, of the way forward. So um, behind closed doors is actually still quite a costly thing for, for, for clubs and would present a challenge for us. So. Um, and you know, really, um, it's it's not it's not an ideal scenario for us. Um, as to the probability of playing uh, the season, um, obviously the other guys can have a view too. Um, but uh, I, I think we we've said we would like that to happen in an ideal world. Of course, we would, but we want that to be in a position where it's um, safe to do so, and that you know, footballers can play safely. Um, and that um, there are no risks at all. Now, whether or not we can guarantee that um, in this current climate, I, I'm not so sure. So for me, um, I think, um, you know, I think it's very difficult to see a situation where we might complete the season, certainly in timeframes that um, have been suggested in, in May and June. 
And um, if there is a completion, then that runs into other problems further down the line. So that's where I stand. I, I thought it was a really relevant point that you made, Simon, in your statement, because I've not heard this from anybody else in what I've read anyway, concerning football this week, in that, yes, we're looking at fan safety in playing in front of football crowds again, but nobody has considered player safety. I complete, I agree. I think, well, you know, Neil, Neil's in more day-to-day -day contact with the players than I am. But again, I, I'm not being critical of other, other owners, but I'm sure that people are doing things behind the scenes. But it does seem to me that it, you can play behind closed doors, but this is a contact sport. You know, how are we going to say to, you know, Niall Canavan, we want you breathing down the neck of the striker for 90 minutes. Um, what does that do to the opposing striker? Um, it, it seems to me that this can only happen with the consent of the players. And, you know, it is Argyle's position that if any player, that, that it is Argyle's position that should the league say we're going to play behind closed doors and should we come up with some solution to how the revenue gaps are going to be funded, which is going to be a bigger issue for many clubs than it is for Argyle, but it's a very big issue for us. You know, Andrew talked about the cost, but the, the real problem is not just that we have the cost, but we have no revenues. So that gap could be crippling for many clubs. But it's absolutely key that it be done with the consent of the players. And, you know, I, I'm almost convinced that there will be plenty of players who, for very good reason, will say, sorry, if it's not safe for spectators, it can't possibly be safe for me. And, you know, Argyle's position will be that we will not require any, any, any player to play if he feels uncomfortable about it. Is, is this something, Neil, that, that the players have raised concern about in, in discussions you've had with them in, in recent days? It, yes, very much so. Uh, Ryan and Shuey are, are in contact uh, day by day with the players, more so than myself. Uh, but, but it crops up in discussions that we have every day. Uh, and I think Andrew and Simon have, uh, have already uh, said it, but I would also add my words to that as well. The safety of, of the players is, is obviously uh, paramount, really, isn't it? We, we couldn't possibly risk uh, one of our players or an opposing player, for that matter, uh, coming away with, uh, well, getting the virus, quite frankly. Uh, and, and in every squad, there will be different cases. So Simon just referred to, to one of our players. Uh, there are others as well in our squad who would be a little bit more high risk than perhaps uh, the, the average player, if, if you like. Uh, but equally, other clubs will, will have the same scenarios going on. So uh, w when all this is finally decided, and I hope that's in the very near future, uh, I really hope the players uh, are consulted because uh, I'm not so sure... They've had a big enough say so far. Well, maybe the players' union will will get involved in those discussions as and when that time comes. And Neil, three fans have, have um, asked similar things. So two questions from three fans, if you like. Derek Barchop, John Christie and Mark Head uh, are wondering about the club sending out players with a view to offering contracts for next season and also the loss of income. How seriously is that going to affect player recruitment for next season? Well, I'll, I'll let Andrew uh, kind of deal with the second part. J just in terms of our current situation regarding contracts, uh, people will be aware of, I'm sure, uh, the 30th of June is a, is a, a date that is looming large uh, and getting closer, obviously, uh, which, which is very, very relevant to, to this whole scenario, really, of uh, can we play? Uh, will people be playing for the same team, et cetera, et cetera. What, what we do know is we've currently got five players who are contracted uh, into next season uh, and, and everybody else will be uh, a discussion for the manager and his staff to, to obviously think about who he would like to take forward. That, that picture is discussed by us as a staff uh, virtually every day. Uh, Ryan certainly already well formulated his thoughts and his ideas. Uh, but of course, uh, and, and I need to say, one of the fantastic qualities that Ryan and Stephen Schumacher both have is an ability to uh, develop a team identity, a, a group density in the dressing room. Uh, the minute that they start going to player A instead of player B, all that suddenly starts getting 
uh, challenged, uh, uh, obviously. Uh, and I'll uh, remind us all that currently we, we are in great shape, having heard, uh, having earned the right to that uh, position in the league. Uh, and Ryan was very uh, keen to get the timing of those discussions quite right. And obviously the virus has taken away that opportunity as we speak. Uh, so, so it's an ongoing discussion. And, and of course, Andrew, managers, coaching staff as a unit, they, they, they are doing their homework 12 months of the year in identifying possible future signings. But of course, having a broad knowledge of what that budget would be for the following year. So, so this is where you can see the difficulty lies. Yeah, um, it, it does. I mean, um, we we aim to have a competitive budget, um, you know, with it within the league, uh, and of course, that competitive budget is also based, um, as we've discussed, on the revenue that we've we're able to generate or and, and hopefully generate. So, um, you know, crowds of over eleven thousand and the hospitality and all of those things which we we've said before. Um, but it's not just us; all clubs will be impacted by that. What I think you can definitely see is that um, the outcome of this will be that uh, loss of revenue across the board will mean there'll have to be an adjustment in, in wage costs. And um, we don't know where that exactly will land, but you know, broadly speaking, we may be in a position where um, you know, about more than 50% of our revenues next season may, may be reduced. And therefore there has to be a cutting of cloth as it were in order to, to uh, Get the player wages in 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 line with in line with that sort of expectation, um, and it'll be relative. So yes, there'll be a, a recalibration of those those things, and the and uh, you know the, the the player and the wage costs, etc., and the the budget budget. But I'm sure when we do get out the other side, if when we do get the other side, as Simon has said, we're in a stronger position than most, and that should mean relatively that all the work that uh, Ryan, Shuey, Neil have been doing in terms of recruitment, et cetera, should allow us to still be able to compete in, in, in that sort of market, as it were. I, 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 so, sorry, Gordon, I, I actually think it will enhance our competitive position. You know, as I said, we're in a relatively strong financial position. What we can afford on the budget depends in an absolute sense on our revenues, but how competitive we are, as Andrew says, is, is relative to what others can afford. And I think we're going to come out of this stronger. We went into this looking like we were going to be much stronger over the next couple of years to the extent that the board was prepared to say that our five-year mission was to be a sustainable championship club, by which we meant um, that our revenues would be sufficient for us to finance a team that had a reasonable chance of staying in the championship. Um, all those investments that we've made over the last couple of years have been in two things. They've been in physical infrastructure, such as the grandstand that you can, uh, that Gordon looks like he's sitting in, <laughs> overlooking the uh, Lindhurst. Um, you know, that, the point of that was to generate revenues for reinvestment in the first team. Um, we've uh, invested in, you know, better uh, facilities for our players with a view to making it easier to attract players down to Devon. But we've also been investing in human capital and, you know, we've had radical changes in the management at Argyle over the last year or two. And, you know, two of them, Neil, is uh, in a new role as director of football where his uh, he's responsible for taking a lead on structuring our recruitment efforts, as well as taking a lead on improving the output of our academy. Uh, we've got Andrew, who's obviously got you know tremendous experience in um, um, you know managing uh, stadiums, managing consumer organisations, managing organisations that help look after the people who you know are providing the revenue to uh, invest in uh, or spend on playing teams. So we were in a really, really strong position before this virus came in terms of generating extra revenues over the next two or three years that would enable us to have very, very competitive uh, first team whilst also making necessary investments elsewhere throughout the club. When football starts again, all those investments are still gonna be there. Um, and that's not gonna be the same for other clubs. So you know, the, the revenues we're going to be able to generate, I, I think are going to be relative, relative to other clubs are going to be much, much stronger. And that means that our ability to have a very competitive 
uh, first team remains remains uh, even stronger than it was before. So, you know, it's a terrible thing that's happened to football. Um, and, you know, it's a terrible thing that we're having this chat when we should be, you know, 2-0 up at Port, Port Vale yeah. on our way to... <laughs> on our way to celebrating promotion, but Argyle's relative position could well end up being enhanced here. I'll, I'll move it on, Simon, because we're all keen to get as many points from our from our fans in as we can. And it That's Gordon's way of telling me to shut up. No, not at all. Because, <laughs> uh, I want you to continue in that vein, if you like, because David Giles says that uh, in your notes on Thursday, shareholder equity should continue to be a valid top top up for clubs that yes. have a in revenue. Although we're lucky in that regard and making sustainable decisions, mm. how can clubs be protected when player contracts and other commitments continue beyond the point when, when a shareholder is willing to be able to support? Well, you know, Gordon, in, in one sense we're lucky, but in another we've been we've just been very prudent. You know, we, I mean, I personally have a dislike of being in debt. I very rarely had anything other than a mortgage in my life. And as soon as I can pay that off, I'd, I've always done so. So I personally have a, a antipathy for debt. You know, I, I'm in the investment world and stuff happens and crises occur. You know, I've been in the business for 40 years and crises seem to appear at least every, every eight or nine years. And if you're indebted, you, you're out of business. Um, so, you know, the, the first thing to say about debt is don't take it on. Um, because something will happen that will put you put you in problems. Now, debt can be you know borrowing money in, in return for payment schedules and paying interest to the person lending it. But a form of debt, a form of uh, gearing, as you say in the UK, or leverage, as we say in the US, is promising to make payments when you're not assured of revenues. And Argyle has not been lucky in having. Um, in not having long-term commitments other than the debt. So, you know, maybe Argyle has been lucky in finding me who's prepared to put shareholders money in, but the club, the board has been very prudent in not having long-term commitments to player contracts. And we've been criticized for it, but we've said, you know, it's too risky to have long-term player contracts down in this league where you're so dependent on, um, you know, match day revenues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're dependent on the fans coming in, paying, you know, for their seats, paying paying for their you know beer and pasties, paying for stuff in the shop, and if that that were ever to have disappeared, then we'd have been in trouble. Well, it has disappeared for all clubs. So you know, sorry, I'm again, I'm talking too much. But you know, I think the main point is that we have not been lucky. We've been prudent, and other clubs have not been as prudent, and they've taken a risk that the revenues that they were going to generate will continue to be able to finance the long-term obligations they took on. And, you know, that's, that's frankly why they're now, they're now in more trouble than we are. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been the model for football. And you, you have two ways of, of overcoming that model. You either exercise, exercise self-restraint or you impose rules that will um, exercise that self-restraint for you. And, for the sake of Argyle, we think it should be down to individual decisions because we've made better ones, I think, than some clubs. But for the sake of football, I think we need to make sure that uh, everybody behaves prudently. And, you know, Argyle does support the current talks that are going on at the English Football League about um, some ways of restraining the uh, risk taking of, of, uh, of some clubs. And on the subject of finances, perhaps, Andrew, if you'd like to, to first respond to this, I'm going to mix in three questions that were sent by Tony Phillips, Derek Bartrop and Anthony Proud. And a lot of fans have been so, so grateful for the football club and the support that Plymouth Argyle is giving the NHS at the moment. And it really has set a fine example in sport. I think everyone will agree. But what's going to happen with current season tickets if remaining games are played behind closed doors. I know that some fans have offered to forego any refund of, of ticket costs to, to help out the club, Andrew. Well, look, you know, it's it's clearly a difficult situation because we, we we don't know the position as yet that we will be in. And at the moment, the commitment is to play play those games. Um, but of course, if that doesn't happen, then, you know, in, in the long term, and we would obviously look to honour those refunds. Um, uh, we, you know, we would look as well, though, 
potentially to look at other ways we might be able to to um, to offset that. So, as an example, um, some season ticket holders may decide that they want that as from a discount for next year, as um, take it off the, the the following season. Or indeed, you know, of course, it is a big financial liability for the club. So. Um, you know, I know we've already had some fans who said, look, you know, whatever happens, you know, um, I'm happy to, to have committed my, my money and, and understand the position you're in. And so, um, look, we'll, we'll, we'll honour it if, if, if that's the case. But equally, you know, let's, let's, let's just be clear, too, that it, it, is, it is a difficult situation. So, um, uh, you know, we'll do our very best to, to, to make sure it goes in the right way. And we, we never fail to be a standard by some of the fans ongoing support in more ways than one simon absolutely um you know financial support um offers of help it's just been tremendous and you know i i just i thank everybody for their 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 support that's been offered in any, any way they can and you know we'll be we've looked at ways of getting fans engaged um, it's obviously difficult in a period of so social isolation but you know i think this is something that argyle has been working on you know, Andrew in particular, you know, since he arrived, we've had, you know, days of fans going around with, you know, bu buckets of uh, soapy water and mops. We've we've had fans being invited to opening ceremonies. We've, we've done our very, very best to engage the fans in their club as much as we possibly can. And, you know, we're getting the kind of response that we'd hoped at, at this time of crisis. So, you know, we, we thank everybody for their for their support and we just, we just obviously wish that we we could uh, thank you in person at home park neil as, as time goes on this would be the subject down the pub if we were allowed to go down to the pub at the moment but in our workplaces on the phones with our friends we're all talking about how should the season end if, if it's scrapped what would happen with teams who have been given point deductions for example this, this is a this is a huge minefield isn't it yeah, I, I think uh, we, we have a staff meeting every Wednesday uh, evening uh, and, and Ryan insists that we, we kind of have a glass of wine or a bottle of beer uh, with us and we, we reproduce the, the pub scenario as you've just described uh, over Zoom. Uh, I thought that was a song by Fat Larry's band in the <laughs> 80s, uh, but I've, I've now discovered it's something else. Showing uh, your eyes, Neil. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 No, don't ask me to sing it, Andrew, please. Uh, no, well, don't worry. <laughs> uh, and, and we we had uh, a, a long debate around this the other evening, uh, but but everyone was really of the same mind. So first of all, it's got to be uh, people first, uh, and, and I guess we've already touched upon that within this uh, conversation. Uh, if if the season was was to end, uh, and I think we think it's going to, uh, and, and unlikely to to kind of be finished. Uh, then we probably think the fur furthest ways to go average points per game uh, uh, with no relegation. That would be probably the furthest way to do it. So there is no pressure on the teams who are currently lying at the bottom of leagues. Uh, but equally, there is an obvious uh, formula for uh, promotion. Uh, and I already know your next question, and that will be, uh, well, that means that we get promoted then. Uh, yes, it does, uh, and I'm not going to shirk that at all. Uh, Ryan and the staff and the players have worked extremely hard uh, from what would be kind of July the 1st. Uh, I remember doing a goal-setting session with the players uh, very early on in the season, and it was quite clear what they were about. They were very strongly about getting uh, Argyle promoted. Uh, and if that's kind of how it pans out, and I stress... Uh, putting people first and the current situation in our country, uh, then so be it. The, the point came from Dave Searle that I put to you, and I, and I hope that, Dave, you're uh, happy with Neil's response there. Interesting, isn't it? All, all our different views on this. And, Andrew, moving back to you, uh, Rob Bowden's been in touch and says that he's really in, impressed with the new hospitality mm -hmm. offering at Home Park. How successful has that been pre-pandemic? And is there a time scale on phase two completion? That is the corners of the stadium. Is there a possibility more hospitality or corporate offerings may be put in those areas? 
First of all, um, the uh, hospitality bean and the new Mayflag <laughs> has been absolutely fantastic. It's very successful. So both on a match day and uh, non-match day twos, um, mustn't forget that because I think on, on a match day perspective, uh, the comments that we've had and the feedback have been really fantastic. And I think we've really endeavoured to make it about ser a service proposition too. So an experience. And so, you, you know, everything that you get with that and... Uh, you know, without exception, I think we've had positive comments about the um, way we've been able to do that with the, with the teams. And um, I think the other great thing about that is it, um, it's a really great atmosphere in there. Um, you know, it's got, we've got um, people of all ages in there. And I think the other thing that's been a part of the success is we've been able to um, employ um, people as well. You know, so young, young people, within the community have been able to um, have an active role in, in uh, developing this proposition, which has been fantastic. And on the non-match day side, I would say already, this is the best facility um, in Plymouth, you know, in t and uh, the wider area for delivering conferences. And again, um, we've been able to get feedback to that in that respect. Easy so, access, um, free parking. Pardon? Easy access, free parking. Yeah, absolutely. Easy access, free parking, uh, great service as well. And I, I think we, we've really got something that um, when Simon talks about investment, this is a good example of the investment for the, for the future and which will make sure that we're competitive over and above um, other venues and other, other clubs as well. So it's been really important. And um, obviously that's factored into our long-term sustainability plan as well for, for, uh, for the future. As to um, the corners, I think we've got to take, um, I'm, I'm sure Simon will jump in in a second too, but I think we've got to take one step at a time here too, because um, clearly, um, you know, the hospitality in the Mayflower Sand was about providing a business model that would provide long-term revenues. And therefore, that then means that you're then able to compete on the pitch, you know, being able to have a competitive squad, etc. And we've got to see how that might work over two or three years, not, not one year. It's got to be seen over a number of years. I think the other part to that is it's a, a dynamic that you've got to get right. You know, the investment, you need to get the return too. So by filling in the corners, what additional income would we be able to generate and what additional services we'll be able to provide? And until we've got that business case to be able to justify that, then, um, then we would we would we would hold fire at this particular stage. In the long term, obviously that that may be a different situation. But for now, I think we've got to work on the business model that we were looking to develop, uh, which included the Mayflower Grandstand. I don't know if Simon wants to add anything uh, uh, to that. Uh, not not really, Andrew. I think you've summed it up. You know, the the issue with the corners is that we, you know, of course, we'd love to fill the corners in, but it's a question of priorities and. You know, the priority now is making sure that the club is financially secure. So when it's very low on the list of priorities, frankly, at the moment. If we were operating at full capacity with Home Park at almost every game, that is that, you know, we had demand for over 20,000 uh, seats or standing, another issue that I'm sure will come up once this crisis is over. You know, if, if there were demand, then th then it would move up the list of priorities. But you know, once we get back to playing, once we get revenue generate, generating, the pr first priority will be to finance a team that is going to be very competitive. If there's money left over, then we will look again at uh, uh, filling in the corners. Or alternatively, if somebody else wants to pay, pay for it, they're very welcome. There we are, the invitation's there. Um, Simon, David Simons puts a question to you in that, it seems entirely possible that many fans will be unable, maybe in some cases, unwilling to attend live matches when we are permitted to. And in that view, does, does the club have plans to review the contracts with the EFL? And also, I follow to extend live streaming of matches, possibly for a limited amount of time within the UK. Um, yeah, look, we've been big supporters of iFollow. Um, we get more revenue from iFollow than many other clubs, um, partly because our fan base is so big and because our fan base is spread out even as far as Pennsylvania. And uh, I'm sure that we've got some people in California listening in this morning. So, you know, the Argyle fan base is all over the world. And um, that's something that we've been able to um, 
uh, generate revenue from, uh, as we've offered the service of, um, you know, making our Argyle games available on live TV. Um, so, you know, it's a great service for us expats. Um, you know, I obviously benefit from it. We've, we've got Argyle fans who, who put together, you know, Saturday morning entertainment. Um, we, we've had a couple of meetings in my region that either I've put on or some of our other fans have put on, for, for which thanks. You know, it's been great. It's been a great service. And we've invested in it, let's not forget. You know, so Argyle has spent some money putting in a four camera system. We now have, um, should I say, better... I mean, not the greatest commentators of all time, of course. We know who they are, but um, we had pretty good commentary. We had full camera system. And it's, a, it's not, I'm not going to pretend it's uh, Sky or BTEL, but it's a, pretty good, it's a pretty good service. And, you know, we would like the rules to be relaxed for us to offer that service to more of our fans in any case. Under, the t under this crisis, I think it's going to be essential um, you know, that we give access to all fans, people who, even when it's, even when the government say, says it's safe to travel, pe perhaps our fans are going to be a little bit more reluctant. They're going to be a little bit more reluctant to stay in hotels. Um, and we, we think that uh, it would be a good idea to make football available to people who want to be ultra cautious. And that, that's going to require relaxation of the rules. And again, we've, we've already suggested that to the FL and we're in, we're in discussions, but again, th this is our view. You know, there will be other clubs who are worried about threats to their match day revenue through actual attendance from I follow. And, you know, we disagree, but you know, th those are decisions that are going to have to be made, as Andrew said, collectively. And they're not always going to be to Argyle's advantage. We, we, we fully accept that. But healthy discussion. Nonetheless. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want to try and get as many points as we can in before three. So Neil, next one to you. And we, we talked about budgets earlier. Matthew Penny has asked, are we in good shape for life in League One, assuming that Plymouth Argyle achieves promotion? And also, will it be possible to sign Alex Palmer and George Cooper on permanent contracts after their loan spells? Uh, well, uh, a few things there, really. First of all, we, we need to uh, plan and prepare to be in either Division One and Division Two. Uh, and depending on which one we're in, then I'm sure Simon and Andrew will make sure that Ryan has a very uh, competitive uh, budget uh, to to be successful in whichever league that is. Uh, what in relation to George and Alex? I noticed this week that they've both been nominated uh, for uh, representative teams of the season. Uh, I think, uh, if I'm right, George uh, within Division Two, uh, and I think Alex actually within the whole football league. I think I'm right in saying so. Uh, congratulations to those two and. Uh, it, it kind of indicates what a great impact they've had uh, for us this season. Uh, may, maybe it's worth noting the bigger picture. So uh, Ryan, myself, uh, Shuey, uh, Nance and, and also Jimmy Dickinson uh, have already spent uh, lots of hours over Zoom uh, talking to one another, doing our research around uh, the squad uh, for next year in terms of players that, that Ryan may particularly want, obviously, to keep and those that uh, uh, we're targeting maybe from uh, elsewhere. Uh, what I would say is the loan strategy of which, obviously, George and Alex are part of uh, will be a major or certainly a significant part in that overall strategy. Uh, uh, so I'm being a little bit coy not to say whether we are or we're not signing Alex or George, but I I'm sure they're very uh, prominent in Ryan's mind. Okay. Uh, Daryl Barkwell asks, Simon, about a statement you made in February, the, your aim for Argyle to be a sustainable championship site. With all the recent uh, troubles that we've been through as a, as a nation, has this impacted on, on those ambitions? Um, well, it, it's had the impact. I mean, look, look, if we don't play football for five years, we're not going to get to the championship in five years. So it's going to be delayed by the delay in football. But as I said, I do think our relative position is going to be enhanced. So, you know, we, we haven't even discussed the idea of change, changing that goal. And you know, if, if it were down, down to me and not down to the whole board, I'd, I'd, I'd reaffirm it. I very much our, our, continuing, our continuing mission, yes. And, and I think our position has been enhanced. And talking of lead structure, Graham Clark makes a point. Possibly Graham sent the question in before your statement came through in the week because... 
he he asks about the possibility of reorganisation of League One and League Two to create League One North and League Two South. Are you a fan? No. Um, hi, Graham. Um, no, we're, we're, we're opposed to it. Um, look, there, there are a whole bunch of reasons that are to do with how we think it would end up working. Um, we're not sure that it would lead to very well balanced between North and South. We're not sure that the leagues would be terribly, um, that the individual leagues would, or individual divisions, sorry, would have a competitive balance. Um, and there, I have to say that there's part of me that says it's a core part of being an Argyle fan, that we travel long distances. Um, it's a part of our brand. It's something that our fans relish. You know, the, despite the fact that, um, you know, we travel more miles, we take more fans than any other club in um, league, certainly leagues one and two, I think, which is, which is remarkable. And I think it's, uh, part of me says, I just like that. And I think our fans do. So, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, we, we there, there are kind of technical reasons, but there's also the kind of more emotional. It's a core cool part of being an Argyle fan, getting on that bus. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And, um, and and even the argument that might be made for, um, if, if you like, saving costs, where actually travel is quite a small part of the yeah. overall cost budget. And indeed, uh, going to sign, going to even for us, I mean, even going to Simon's point as well is... Uh, when we played Carlisle, which was like an 800 mile round trip, there were more fans that came from Plymouth to the Carlisle game than there were for the Morecambe game, for the Morecambe fans that went up to Carlisle, which is their nearest local derby. So yeah. they would have actually made more revenue from us going to that game than, than the Morecambe game. So, yeah, there, there, there's another point as well, actually, that um, I should have mentioned. And, you know, in some ways, I'm a classic example. You know, I grew up in Plymouth in the 60s and 70s and then left. And, you know, Plymouth has not always been a successful city. I, you know, I happen to think it's, you know, having a big, big rebound now, but uh, absent this virus. But, you know, there's a very wide diaspora of uh, Argyle fans all over the country. And I think being able to offer them uh, a game, an away game in their region is, is, a, is, a, is a real attraction. There, mm. there, there's, a, there's also something about the football. And, you know, Neil may, may like to address it, but... In the past, when I've spoken to players about it, they've, they've said, yeah, you know, it's tough, but um, we do a lot of bonding on the bus and it kind of helps build team spirit. And I think that's only been enhanced this season under um, under the football management team that we have now. Um, you know, Ryan, Shuey, Nance um, and Neil, um, you know, they're very, very well, com they have very great contacts throughout um, professional football in England in England and they've changed the system whereby we now go up, I think a day before uh, we stop at some, you know, one of Neil's mates training facilities, he, he, you know, he runs Loughborough university or he runs Aston Villa or something. And so our players get to see other training facilities. It brings a bit of variety in as well as the whole bonding experience. And uh, Joe Edward told me it gets him away from his, uh, twins for a night or two which is um not not a bad thing for his sleep habits I, I i don't know what you think about it neil and neil yeah. in, in answering I, that, neil uh, we've had a we've had a point on youtube uh, to bring you into it as well from from ben ben earl and um, and he wants to know if if all the players and the staff are, are all well at the moment if they're in good form yeah very very much so so uh john lucas uh our uh, conditioning coach he has got them all uh, on zoom again i have to say uh, working every other day, uh, he does it in two groups. He changes the groups around so everyone's kind of interacting with one another. Uh, everyone's in great shape. Uh, some of the staff aren't. I need to tell you that one or two of the staff need to work a little bit harder, but the players are in really good shape uh, physically and probably just as importantly mentally. Uh, that that's obviously another big debate within uh, the the epidemic of how people are coping. Uh, in isolation uh, so it's very important that we get the lads together in some format uh, and John to his credit has, has done that really well over the last couple of weeks uh, can, I, can I go back very quickly to, to the last point which was about the, the travel uh, pe people told me uh, the travel was a real ne negative for Argyle and its teams uh, I, I would dispute that for all the reasons Simon just said 
and also add one, which is uh, the, the coach we've turned into a, a learning environment. So it's an opportunity where mm. the staff can sit with the players uh, on computers and watch videos and study opponents and study their own performance and so on. Uh, and, and the players, as you would hope, uh, have bought into that quite strongly. So I, we, we, we see that journey time uh, as a real positive uh, experience for us. Mm. Right. Um, Simon, do you want to quickly jump in there? Yeah, I just want to ask Neil. Know? I think Neil mentioned that some of the staff are not doing their kind of fitness programme, and I think we should name names. Yeah, start start with me, I'm afraid. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nanskerville. Nanskerville, if you're watching Nanskerville, get running. Oh, Right, we've got nine minutes left. Can we do quick fire uh, so we can get as many points in from fans as we can, if that's okay, gents? Um, this from Dan Williams and Nathan Stocker and said, would it be a good idea after all the connections that the club has made with the NHS if we could carry the, an NHS logo somewhere on the kit next season, Simon? Um, I, well, for, for, a, for a start, we have sponsorship ar arrangements already in place, I'm afraid, so that would be extremely difficult. Um, but th but there's, there's a wider issue that I actually feel quite strongly about. Um, who does it benefit for us to put thanks to the NHS on our shirts? Does it benefit the NHS or does it make us feel better about ourselves? And I kind of suspect it just makes us feel better about ourselves, that we're signalling our support for the NHS. And Argyle has done much more than signal support for the NHS. We've handed over our brand spanking new grandstand for, for, um, for maternity testing, for blood testing and so on, thus releasing vital capacity at Derriford. So we're not just signaling our support for the NHS, we're actually saving lives. So I feel quite strongly that there are much more important things than putting badges on the back of your shirt. Okay, Andrew, uh, Matthew Gibbs and Pete Hornsby want to know, can supporters who wish to purchase a ticket in advance for next season, i.e. season tickets, can they do so now? Well, it's uh, it's a bit early to do that because uh, we, we've got to find out exactly what the how the season will work, when it will work, and so on. But as soon as we we've, we've got sight of that and how uh, you know it's clarity with the EFL on the position of season, um, the season, then obviously we will put them on sale and be able to purchase in advance. It's just a bit early for us to be able to position that, given as well that we don't know whether the season's going to be completed yet as well. And which league we'd be in. So keep an eye on the official Plymouth Argyle channel, Simon. I, I'm sorry? Keep an eye on the official Plymouth Argyle outlets, the website. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, the issue here, we, you know, the, the, this is about the difference between solving short term cash flow problems and solving long term gaps between revenue and expenses. And, mm. you know, we're very grateful to fans for their offer of advanced payments, but that's not really the problem. You know, we the problem is going to be you know the long term gap between revenues and expenses. So you know, th thanks for these offers, but um, in, in fact, the problem's a little bit bit longer term than that. Yeah, and equally, we don't know how if we might be playing behind closed doors for a certain yeah. amount of those games yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah. that's the other complicating factor. Yeah, exactly. So given that the cash flow, you know, is going to be okay, we don't want to muddy the waters by selling season tickets now before we know what fans are going to be getting for the for right. those tickets. Let's see if we can get at least five points in in the last five minutes, all from YouTube viewers this afternoon. And the first one for you, Neil, from Philip Lee. If the EFL expects us to complete the season in June or July, will we still have a full squad of players or will there be players not available because they're out of contract? Yeah, I, I just refer back to that uh, date that's looming big and large uh, once we get past June the 30th, uh, it, it becomes so, so difficult. Uh, players out of contract, agents involved, uh, promises to go to other clubs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I, I just think that if there's a way, uh, if there would be a way to complete before that day, uh, great. Uh, I, I, as I've already said, I, I don't think uh, I, I see that happening. No, I, I agree. There is there is the potential, though, to play in um, July. It's complicated, but that would be um, because there's a one-month notice period for players out of contract. But obviously, is that that doesn't mean to, to say that they're obliged to do that either. So um, it's difficult and complicated. So if, Neil, we're in a stronger position, as been pointed out this afternoon, News Route 1 asks, 
in comparison to other clubs, are we in a stronger position? Do we have an advantage over signing players? Uh, well, we, we, I guess we don't know that exactly. What we do know is uh, we're in great shape uh, in terms of what Simon and Andrew have spoken about in terms of having a competitive budget. Uh, we've done our research uh, and planning uh, for next year as far as we can possibly go at this stage. So we're, we're ready, I guess. We're ready to go. Simon so, Kimber wants sorry, to Sorry, Jed, just again to yeah. add, and I know you're trying to get five in five. This has part of, been part of our long-term plan. You know, this is why we have um, a family room for players after games. This is why we've spent money on changing rooms. Um, you know, we've made Argyle a much more attractive place for players to come, and I, I don't think we've, we've done ourselves any disservice in, in the recent uh, few weeks. And Simon Clare Kimber says, what can fans do over the coming weeks and months to help the football club? Uh, very good. Well, keep offering support. Keep um, engaging with our social media channels. Please, you know, watch anything like this. You know, just just keep engaging as far as you can. We're doing our best to put stuff out. Give us your reactions. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Um, keep coming up with ideas about you know the long term future of the club. Just keep keep being part of the discussion. We can't get together physically, and we're not going to be able to for quite a while, as far as I can see. So okay. let let's just try to do more of this let's try to keep engaging through all the channels we you know we've um furloughed a great deal of our staff but we've kept on uh jamie absolutely dan cole who are you know working very hard on our social media so you know please just engage with it give us your response if you don't like it tell us if you do like it tell us if you've got something to say tell us if you've got a joke to crack tell it you know well, please Devin engage to put a point to you guys and i suppose uh devon scouse or andrew you'd be in, in the prime position to answer this one but as you said, there's no plans to fill in the corners. Can the disabled fans have a bit of protection? They say they get a bit windswept where they are. Although they, they pr presumably love the view. Oh. It's a fantastic view they get, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, I think we've we've still got things to try and address around the, st around the stadium. I, I don't think there's anywhere around the stadium that doesn't get windswept. And, you'd, and even with the roof, that you don't get wet as well. So it, it is, does present a bit of a challenge for us. But I think the coming... Months and, and years, we got opportunity to look at that in terms of uh, in, improving still further the facilities. I think we've made great strides over, over the last couple of years and indeed this year, and we'll continue to do that. Neil Tremblett puts a, a point about a scoreboard. You won't remember, Andrew, maybe the old scoreboard at Home Park, which rarely works. I think we can all remember the score during a game at Home Park, but Neil points to sponsorship and advertising opportunities and adding yeah. to the match day experience. Yeah, really good point and something that we've definitely got on our agenda. We've in discussions around doing that. So it provides obviously if it, you know, good, good ones can provide entertainment as well. And as, as rightly said, it's a, uh, an opportunity for sponsors. I think Andrew's link has just gone down for a second. Uh, we've got two minutes before we go into any additional time added on. Uh, Neil, I don't know if if we go around the panel just to give any closing thoughts as to what your views are and, uh, and, future. and and how we go forward in the future. Neil, do you want to start that off? Yeah, well, f first of all, I think we, we all have to remember uh, why uh, we're, we're all kind of uh, in lockdown. Uh, it's a very, very difficult time for the country. Uh, and I hope football isn't arrogant enough to get ahead of itself. Uh, we, we need to remember that there's a lot of people having a, a lot of tough times out there right now. Uh, so that, that's the first thing to say. Uh, and then sensibly, uh, we're utilising our time uh, as a staff, as a group of players wisely, so that when football does return, uh, our guy will be well placed to do the best that it can do. Closing message from you, Andrew. Uh, well, of course, it's a challenging time. But the one thing I would say is over these last few weeks, how fantastic it's been that the club has really come together. The support of the fans has been tremendous. People have been working at the club have done a fantastic job. And I think we've really um, shown our, our strength as a, as a club, has won our gal over these last few weeks. And that has got to be a good platform, whatever we face for the future. And I, I don't know if you've heard this, Simon, but uh, I understand it with, with good word from the Argyle Media Department that there are plans to maybe repeat this exercise with representatives from the football club again in the near future, as, as we ask you to give your, your closing thoughts. 
Uh, well, first of all, yeah, as I said just now, you know, we're, we're looking at all ways of engaging with the fans, um, you know, during this, uh, during the lockdown. And, you know, I'd obviously encourage fans to continue to engage with us and we will very much look to do this again. Um, I think I'd just like to leave people with the thought, uh, firstly, of course, to, you know, agree with Neil and Andrew for what, what they've said. You know, this is a terrible problem facing the entire country. Please, please, please continue to uh, socially isolate, stay as far away as you can. I thank everybody who is unable to do so. Um, that, that's not just the NHS workers, but also, you know, our delivery people, our grocery people, our supermarket operators and so on. I know that we've got a lot of Argyle fans out there um, who are essential workers. And, you know, I thank them for their service, as we say in the United States. Um, so, you know, thanks to them. Everybody else, please, please don't believe some of the nonsense that's going around and try to stay away as far away from other people as you can. The more that we do that, the quicker we're going to get football back. But as Neil says, you know, football is really a secondary issue here. Um, again, I just want to re reiterate what I think has been a theme of my remarks in the last hour, that football faces an existential threat. The English Football League faces an existential threat. Um, that means that, that that threat applies to Argyle as well and to Argyle as a football club. But this uh, crisis has exposed not weaknesses at Argyle, but strengths. Andrew's referred to some of them. The financial strength is another. And I think that if we can get through this crisis, then those strengths are going to come to the fore, not Argyle's weaknesses. So I uh, want you to stay, stay away from other people, but I want you to stay optimistic about the future of Argyle. Thank you. Nice to finish on an optimistic line, Simon. Thank you, Neil. Thank you as well. And also, of course, you, Andrew, for your input this afternoon. And, and thanks for your company. And do obviously keep in touch with everything at the football club through pafc.co.uk and uh, the club's official social media channels. And uh, hopefully we will uh, make contact with you, the fans, again in one form or another, hopefully at Home Park, but hopefully very soon. And thank you, Sparksy. Thank you.